How you doing? It's Mike Cofield, author of Getting It Out the Mud book. Right here with Dirty Glove. Let's go. I need more mozzarella, yeah, parmesan. I finessed them, told his dad it was a one on one. But really. We got Mike Cofield off the porch with us today. Yes, sir. How you feeling, man? Hey, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, really, though. Yeah. Yeah, you're yes, the sir. first author. Yes, sir. Uh, sit on our porch, so. I appreciate that. Yeah, no doubt, appreciate man. that. So, are you a Atlanta native? Yes, sir. Born and raised. Grady baby. Grady baby. Yes, sir. What part of the city did you grow up in? Uh, West End. Okay. Harris Home, Projects. All the projects, really, man. Back, back when we were growing up, projects, they hung out, you know. So, if I was from Harris Home, Projects. You can go anywhere. West End, though, you know, like, uh, brother, I mean, he raised me, you know, taught all of us, a lot of us how to play. He really gave us opportunity to travel and play basketball and different things, you know. Uh, was a very strong figure in our neighborhood, you know, like in the same area, Rollo. Okay. Yeah, with Pakistan, yeah. predominantly Muslim area. You know, so I grew up like in the projects and the park was like an extension of the park, you know, an extension of the projects. We didn't actually have a park. So West End was our park. Hmm. Gotcha. Can you talk about how Atlanta has kind of changed over the years, especially with all the projects being, you know, torn down? Yeah, it has changed a little bit. You really got more people push a lot of people out to the outskirts and, uh, Brought a lot of the crime that was going on in the city to the outer city. So it's changed a little bit, but you know, the hustle and bustle is still here. You know, you just, it's Atlanta, Atlanta been a grinding city. So a lot of people think they can come here and just find success, but you know, you gotta be grinding. You gotta be grinding. You gotta stay, you know, keep the, keep the, uh, what you call it, steel to the fire. Mm hmm. Yep. So, I how old would you say you were when you jumped off the porch at first? Oh, uh, man, I actually, man, I was walking around. I was walking around the West End, like, trying to figure out ways to hustle, man, like, probably nine, nine years old. Not really saying I got into a lot of riffraff, but the hustle was in me, like, nine, like, like knocking on people's doors, uh, predominantly women doors like that was didn't have you know male kids need somebody to empty trash need me to straighten your yard up you know just flat foot hustling you know just uh, my mom would go to work and you know basically it was me I was the only I was the only son so I was the only kids a boy so my sister and them go to all uh, go to their little events with their sisters with, with their girlfriends or whatever and I'd be you know left out there walking from West End to Ashby Street to Herner Home to Bankhead to you know just as a as a as a kid so about nine. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you share one of the biggest life lessons you learned while growing up or just coming up here? Uh, man, in '88, man, I had like uh, in '88, right? From probably I graduated from high school in '84. Okay, went to Brown High School, West End. Once again, West End. Uh, went to moving around. Uh, kind of ended up over here in the Boulevard area, Fourth Ward area, which they call the Old Fourth Ward, but it's you know considered to us Fourth Ward. Fourth Ward. Shout out to Fourth Ward. Um, start hustling. Start you know seeing a seeing a little growth and what I was doing in the street. And bam, 1988, four years out of high school, I have a wreck and one of my friends died in the car. You know, so the most heart wrenching part was going to trial because they offered me uh 10 do five, right? So I'm like 20, I'm like 10 do five. So I'm, I hired my law, I had a good lawyer and I basically asked him like, you know, like um, 10 do five, I'm like, 20 man 10 do 5 really so I was like uh, 
what's the worst case scenario if I go to trial? He said, 10 do five. I said, I got to go to trial, you know, because it was, it was very rainy, it was rainy, rainy, rainy situation. And the car really just lost control. And the cop more or less was picking at me about my car, uh, seeing the car in a lot of highly, you know, drug traffic areas. Hmm. And I'm stressing at him like, dude, do whatever you got to do to me. But, you know, my man dying. You feel me? Don't let my man die like that. You feel me? So that was probably one of my life changing moments. Because when I had to go to when I had to go to trial, the uh, deliberation ended up being almost two days, man. So I had a phone call like one one the second day, right? The deliberation still going. It's the jury still. I don't know the concept of if they deliberate this long. Maybe it might be in my favor. I don't know because I've never been in this before. So when the deliberation kept going on past the the time for the court to be out. Like we were the only people in the courtroom. Hmm. So I had to call, I called my mom. I was like, yo, I'm, I'm about to run. So it was like a little pause in the phone. <laughs> then she came back in, she's like, run where? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm not coming to your house. She's like, but the police are. Hmm. So I was like, I never thought about that. You know, because I am your child. And she was like, nah. She was like, nah, you got to ride this one out. You made your bed hard, you know, and uh, hmm. it was a hard pill to swallow, man. But I had to, I had to live it up. You know, she when she said that to me, I just kind of swallowed real hard. Went back in the courtroom. Maybe it was like six o'clock in the evening. They might have came out of deliberation by eight. Like found me not guilty. Oh wow! You know? So I was found not guilty. It was, I was charged with vehicle homicide. And the funny part about it was the cops, man, knew me. You know, the cops that did know me, they was they would periodically like where I stayed at at the time. I don't know if they saw the saw my cars or whatever, but they, he rode by and was like, "How you been?" And I was like, "I've been all right." He's like. Don't tell me you still going to court for that accident, right? I was like, yeah, how did you know? I was like, they still, I had to go to trial. And he was like, man, there's no way they should have, you know, even charged you with that. But you know how the system go, man. Mm -hmm. So, but that was one of my, it just grew me up, man, because my mom was like, she, she always have been like that, but she confirmed it and stopped it like, <sighs> how would I say it? Can't let you be soft. Can't be soft. Whatever you do, you got the answer for it. So, to this day, that's been me and her conversation, man. Yeah, real shit. Yes. All right, talk to us about starting Ghetto Records. Oh uh, man, I kind of, I kind of bumped into Ghetto Records because I was, I started Ghetto Records like most, in, like most uh, label. I would say most independent labels get started. I started off as an artist, really. And it was like five or six of us, you know, a couple of cats writing, a couple of cats producing, a couple of cats promote. So I end up, uh, we did like one showcase. And I was like, nah, man, that ain't me. <laughs> I was like, but I'm gonna keep coming with y'all. I'm gonna find something to do, you know? So I just started, you know, I started more or less like, I'm gonna be out in the crowd. You know, I'm gonna be y'all biggest fan. I'm going to be your biggest promoter and to the point where uh, I think I ran into, we was already recording like at different recording studios around the city, pretty much uh, ran into a few guys that had some uh, inspiration on like producing and at the same time, like I said, I was hustling. So I had the money to kind of put the equipment together and get a guy's equipment and uh, I ran into my man named Bourne, Barney Mac, right? Bourne did a lot of stuff uh, on D4L stuff mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff with uh, Shorty Low, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, he was like my first in-house producer. Okay. We did hits like in the 90s, like uh, Can't Get No Lower, Damage, we did Damage, which was just a production. Then I started working with uh, Vince and Rob McDowell over at BME. 
that was came a little later in the, like 2000. But we put out a lot of records during that time. And I basically started Ghetto Records by way of I, I couldn't rap. I wasn't a rapper, so I had to find my lane. And my lane was more or less putting a lot of people in the room, promoting it. You know what I mean? Just CEO, CEO. I mean, uh, even when I started hustling, man, I, the kids that I was coming up with were, you know, uh, it was the 10 off 100, 20 off 100. And I was like, I don't really wasn't big on working for somebody, you know, so I was like trying to find my way like that. So I was like, let me put it together and try to, you know, get y'all guys some exposure. And voila, we just really, my, my focus back then with Ghetto Record was, uh, and the spot that we had, man, was so central, you know, like in the city. So that's where the name came up, Ghetto, because, you know, we were right there on Walker Street. Okay. Right where uh, Peter Street, Walker Street, mm -hmm. you know, splits. We was, on, we was on the first beginning, like kind of over by Two Chain Spot. That's you know, cool. like if you keep to the left, you know, yeah. that's 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 um like the three hundred right there is like probably a building, or not even a half a building away from the stop sign where where intersects at. So my main focus was just keeping the doors open, man, you know, and just cultivating artists, you know, artists came through the door that were talented. I just opened the door, keep my keep the doors open. I wasn't a big producer, I wasn't the guy I could say that was influenced them on their music because I had good, I had born, I had this other cat named Ed that that was their job, you know. Just if you liked it, I'm gonna push the, I'm gonna push the green, I'm gonna push the green light on it and let you know they didn't. A lot of a lot of the talent back then, if they were talented, they didn't have a lot of money, and most of the people that had money, I wasn't interested in hearing them because it's like their parents wanted them to rap. They didn't. They was like making me a rapper I'm a cute I'm a cute kid like you just trying to make me a rapper but they had the money so we had to slide them in too but I wasn't interested in just saying look I'm a, you know whenever you come to the door just let him in you got some ideas let him create yeah you know so that was the beginning of ghetto records man and who were some of those bigger name artists that came through them doors uh two of the most I mean you got Moot B from D4L Shout out to Moot B. I still, I still rock with Moot B. We, Moot B grew up in, with me in Harris' home, but I was, man, I probably as hard as on Moot B than anybody else, man, because I didn't want anybody around me to feel like, uh, I'm going to give you a shot just because I know you. You feel me? So I felt like that would have been, that would have kind of just brought Ghetto Records down some, like them all his homeboy. Moot came to the door. And my, my, my key punchline was, let me hear what you got. If you tell him you got to come back, you got to write it, forget about it, man. So he gave me some. I'm like, uh, that ain't it, man. I'm like, man. My mic didn't see Mook for like six months. Mook, Mook came back with that crack, man. So, so, so keep in mind, man, no's don't mean no. No mean not no. You feel me? So... And he was driven, man. He was one of the most, I, I do get this to him to this day. He was one, probably one of the most driven artists I dealt with. But I think the bigger artists were Cool Joe and Timo. Okay. You know, because they had a situation at the time. Uh, I think, I want to say they both were in school up in the AU Center. And I'm right around the corner from the AU Center, right? When you talk about, yeah, when you hear Cujo talking about the, the bug, the little bug he had, that's what he was riding in at the time. So Cujo, Timo had a group called Lumberjacks before they originally got with uh, uh, LaFace and signed the deal and formed up Goody Mob. But they tinkered with the name Goody Mob too at Ghetto Records. You know, they was kind of, in the in 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 like in between this and that, but you know, Gip came through. Gip never recorded there. Backbone came through. Backbone used to always give me Backbone used to always give me uh give me hell about uh man. I used to want to record, but I ain't have no money. I'm like <laughs> most of the artists come through my door don't have the money, so you had the green light. You never really he, he never stepped up to try to you know record, but. We ended up recording over here though, uh, probably like 98. 
we did, um, matter of fact, we did that song, we did the demo for Put the Work in the Pot and make Watch It Jump Back. And he eventually, they chose the producer to produce it, but it was actually recorded at Ghetto Records. Okay. And uh, Witch Doctor. Witch Doctor, Kujo Chimo, Barney Macklet, uh, Mook B. That's about it. Man, I had a lot of artists coming through that, though, man. Yeah. And that, for real, for real, Ghetto Records was kind of like the melting pot for artists without any money. Artists needing, you know, a shot. So, you know, I I would take the artists and, you know, put them in showcases, you know. So that was my job. You know, I hustle in the day, put them in showcase at night, you know. So Cujo Timo. Yeah. All right. So talk to us about this new book you just wrote, Getting It Out the Mud. Oh, yeah. My book, my baby. My baby right here. Getting It Out the Mud, man, was really just put together, man, with uh, a lot of people uh, kept asking me for directions and how to do this and what you think about that with the industry changing, how you feel about that. And I was just like, I talked to a couple of people. One of the person I talked to the most was probably a uh, close, close, close friend of mine named Carl Washington, right? Carl Washington, the attorney. Okay. Yeah. So Carl Washington, I spoke to Carl Washington and told him about it. He was like, hey, man, you know, it's like basically you're investing. In, I'm investing into myself. So I put the book out with uh, with a chance of reaching one artist to help him kind of structure and monetize and know all different ways to monetize music other than streaming or sales, you know, because sales started declining. We went from CDs to where in my era, 96, to release with the Ghetto All-Stars, we were actually, you know, trying to mimic some of the stuff that P was doing, you know, uh, E-40 was doing, like, we're going to go get a thousand CDs, we're going to hit the streets, we're going to, you know, give out some T-shirts, but on the back end, we're going to sell some CDs, you know, and CDs were selling 15, 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Because, you know, if you're old school, you know, you had every, I had every No Limit. I had every E40, every, you know, so your your catalog was different. Now everything's been condensed down to um, download, stream, so that's pretty much, man, like, that's pretty much it. What's, what would you say is one of the biggest mistakes artists make? Uh, not asking the right questions, man. You know, because a lot of, a lot of, a lot of artists I talk to, and I stress this to them. I sit, I, I sit down, have a sit down with my artists, and I ask them. I say, just, just this, this is my uh, like meter to see where, see where your mind is, and I ask. The question like do you want do you rather be rich or famous you know most of them say famous i say well i'm gonna get rich off your music <laughs> i don't care about fame you feel me so fame has never paid a bill for me you know rich mean you have some kind of money coming in to to take care of your lifestyle so not asking enough questions man always is always uh and uh, one of the biggest would be not asking a question, but on the next, it's just be they work at it. It's just feel like, oh, Mike, my man, he should put me on. He should open me some doors. But the key to it is you got to do what I'm doing. You see what I, you see where I'm at, right? I'm on the puts. You know what I mean? I'm right here with my man, like, dirty glove. I'm right here. I mean, like, you got to do the stuff or things that you're uncomfortable with to become successful. So... Not saying, you know, some of the behind the, you know, some of the stuff that they say going in the industry. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you to do that. You feel me? But you got to do, you got to work hard, man. You got to be uh, pressed forward. You got to be ready. You got to be ready for the moment, you know, and you got to live up to it. You know, just put it like this. I explained to the artists, I said, you want to be a rapper or a rap artist? Rapper, rapper just running his mouth, man. Rap artists got checks coming to that mailbox 
they got checks hitting their, 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 uh, their bank account, you know, so you just rapping, figure out a way to become a rap artist, you know, so cause rap artists get paid for what they do. Yeah. How have you been able to keep up with all these changes in the music industry? Over I years? haven't even tried to, man. <laughs> just, I've got a lot of older artists that I kind of still mentor to, and they stuck on selling albums. I'm like, you're going to lose me. You're going to lose my support, you know, because it's a give take situation, you know, like merchandise. You got to you got to promote yourself. You got I'm not doing this because I think it's cool. I know this is important. This is important. I put this in somebody's hand 10 years from now. It's cup, this bottle, bottle of water. I mean, Everything that you see that I'm doing, I'm trying to get the artists that come behind me or look at me or if I inspire you, you got to do some of these things. You got to no hit on, you know, showing your money, but you got to spend that money, man. You can't just keep showing that money. You ain't spending it. You know, a lot of a lot of real a lot of real players in the game going to look at you like, man, dude, just that ain't his money. You know, what I mean, I don't want to knock y'all down on how you how you getting this money, but. If you're not invested into yourself, man, and you're waiting on me, perhaps, or a label, perhaps, to invest into you, you know, the ownership is going to swing. <laughs> I'm, the more I invest, the more, uh, more I own. The less you invest, the less you own. So it's, it's, it's simple math, man. Yeah. What advice would you give an artist, you know, who's probably been rapping for a while, but it's decided now to finally take it serious. What's one of the first steps they should do? Uh, I would say really check check your back work, check the work you've done before, you know, see where it is legally, you know, because going forward, you don't want to be tied up in any legal issue and labels, labels ain't going to mess with you. Labels going, one incident come up about somebody calling them and saying they didn't get paid, they're going to drop you. So make sure your paperwork is right. You know, make sure you have all your uh, split sheets. Make sure you have all your publishing on who did your music. So you won't have to submit this music and be, you know, they'll give you an advance and then they'll pull the, you know, pull the plug on you, you know, by, because you didn't handle your business. So you can't, you can't expect the labels to handle your business for you. you Got to handle your business. You got to ask questions. Three, three, three of the most questions I try to tell artists to ask are, when do, when do you release my album or my project? How much of the album would I own? How much ownership do I have to my likeness? How much ownership do I have, period, of this project? And when do I get paid? You know, instead of leaving it up in the air, you know, at least give me that on paper. And then the contracts, I'm going to kind of go back to some of the stuff that you asked from the beginning. You said something about what have changed. A lot of this contract wordage has never changed. It probably never will. So that's why I tell the artists, you know, you got to lock in, have you some good representation, you know, because even in my book, I speak, I, even if I say, uh, some about money. I'm going to say you still need an accountant. You can't take my advice. I'm not an accountant. You feel me? So I'm, I'm only trying to motivate you with this book. I'm not trying to be a, a lawyer. I'm not trying to be an accountant. You feel me? I'm just giving my spill on being a CEO of a record label to where most of the, most of the artists see me pull up in the BMW and I just, I just did one video with you. We haven't sold any records and you saying where your BMW at? Like, you got to get it out the mud. You got to go get it out the mud like I've been doing. You feel me? So I came into the situation with some money to invest and, and, and know my, and learn my, learn this craft. But at the same time, I don't have a BMW to give you. You got to work for this BMW. No one gave it to me. I work for it. You feel me? However I work for it, I work for it. I paid for it. You feel me? So the, the mindset of some artist, man, is just like, I'm going to put this down. And then I'm going uh, to be on top. I'm going to be on top of everything. But not if you don't build a solid foundation. The foundation starts with your paperwork. Yeah. You know? 
What would you say are some pros and cons for an artist when signing with another label? Pros. Pros. They could probably give you the most exposure that you ever had. But <laughs> come with a cost, healthy cost. You know, they might say uh, 10 albums. You know, and the contract word was so crazy in the 90s, bro. I never even, I never moved, born. None of my artists I signed, I gave contracts. I did not believe in the contract wordage. Feel me? So, and most of most of the most of the guy most of the kids most of the guys that I started recording with they were young. You know, most of my main my main artist was this guy I go by Terry Miller. Now, his mom was is a superior court judge, and he was like fifteen. Like, I couldn't get this guy his contract, his mama read the contract. I know he wasn't coming back to my studio. So the contract wording was so 15 pages, 20 pages. And I've, all, I've always said, why so many pages? Like, why? Just just explain that. Even the best lawyers, Joe Katz, any of those guys, I've always asked, why so many pages? Like, are you repeating over and over again? And the words are getting smaller. It's like... It's a catch-22 situation, so, you know, pros and cons would be the label are going to get you the exposure that you need, but the cons are your ownership diminishes. It's, it's very little. They're going to give you a uh, pension of the art that you've been creating for years. They're going to give you a pinch of that, very small pinch of that, and you're going to be... A lot of the stuff, if it don't go well, you're gonna be stuck with them bills. It, it's a it's a deal that could be a bill. <laughs> so then you're gonna get the bill. Yeah. What's your main goal for writing this book and putting this book out? Oh uh, man, I'm trying to really uh dirty glove, man. I'm trying to uh transition into motivation speaking. You okay. feel me? So with this book. I'm using this book as a medium to bring awareness to the unfairness of the artists. The artists are the last person, is the last person that's going to get paid. You feel me? And I used to see the situation going on like, hold on, the manager got what? The artists over here broke, man. This artist over here sleeping on couches. But when you go to some of the managers who manage an artist, they might have 10 artists, they might have five artists, but they living, they living off what they doing because they don't have, they getting, they getting a paycheck more or less than artists, artists are gambling. So I would say, um, man, this book is basically giving artists a roadmap to leverage and ownership to their projects, you know, it's going to be a slower process than being with the major label. But when you do run into that major label, you will be able to, you could call, you know, like my man Eric Thomas say, uh, last year I was getting 20,000, man. You saw me sitting over there with Dirty Glove, right? My numbers done went up. So you see me with Dirty Glove, you know, he popping. So now I'm, I'm with people that's popping. I got to get more money. So by this time a label running to you, you can, you can write your own check. And it's, it's possible. A lot of people don't think it's possible. Yeah, turn you down. You you see, you saw it glow. You see Uzi Vert. You see artists. They they decline. Uh, what's the kid out of Memphis? Uh, tall kid out of Memphis. The rap kid. He like they they've been trying to sign me for years. He just opt out. He don't want a major. He can stay independent. Oh, Young Dolph. Dolph. You know so. I shot, I take I take my head off the door for that, you know, because it's like you you, you it's like you're a grown man, but you signed up for a babysitter. You feel me? So now the label label had to babysit you. Label has to tell you you can't release this. Label has to say, I don't want you around those people. I think you're risky. I you know, some of them might be risky, some of them might be good to say, but they looking at they're not looking at who you communicate with, they're looking at you as an investment. So as you being an investment, they trying to make sure that they 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 they're they're um invest the money that they invested they can recoup or they can profit, you know. So 
Very, that, that's a very important word too. Recoup, recoup. Don't think these labels are doing anything for you without them making their money back, probably with some interest. Mm -hmm. You know, so they give you these budgets and you know, don't jack your budgets off. You know, and I'm trying to put this coalition together with some old brothers, some brothers, period, some music industry brothers to where we could kind of like NL, NLPA kind of oversee the artists. Like when you get your money. You got to put some money to the side. You got to take care of your child support. You got to get your license. You know, you got to do the stuff that the money is there for. Not, you know, don't, I don't want the kids to put a chain over. You riding around with a chain, but you don't have your license and you don't have your, you know, you got a brand new car. You know, you're going to just be down in intake, you know, in the next, next, next hour or so. You're going to be in intake and then you're going to be spending your money back with the system. So, I, once once I get together with the right people and we form formulate this this uh team of just basically overseeing the artists, you know, we don't have to sign you. We want to make sure that you know you get the same deals as a white artist, as a pop artist. So that's where I want to be very forefront on that. Like the artists, uh rap artists are probably bigger than pop artists right now and but they're not making the money like the pop artists are yeah. you know, so and where can people get a copy of this book um hopefully we uh dirty glove add a link to the from it's on amazon you know i want y'all guys to go out there and check my book out you can go to amazon and look it up you know getting it out the mud with two d's and um Mike Cofield, I'm the artist, I mean, I'm the uh, author of the book, and uh, you can go to Amazon. The link will be in the uh, description. I want y'all to subscribe to Dirty Glove, uh, like the video, share it, you know. So these are some of the things that I'm doing with Dirty Glove that artists, y'all got to come out your shell. You got to go do this. This is something I don't want to do, but I know in order for me to reach the people that I need to reach, man, I'm here, you know, so... I'm going to be, you know, on your heels. I'm going to be asking artists, you know, because I, once I leave here, I pass out numbers. I pass out numbers like look for my video, look for my interview, you know, go down there, you know, spend some money with Glove them, sit down with Glove them and, and see, pick their brains, you know. And I'm going to be I'm gonna be staying in touch with you too, picking your brain, you know, on some ways to go on what you think, how, how can I move this issue going forward on, you know, you know, really putting a backbone behind artists. Real shit, man. Yes, sir. All right, Mike. Any last words or shout outs? Uh man, I like to shout out a few artists that I'll be uh communicating with. Uh one of the artists, Grimy Genius, you can follow him on Instagram at Grimy Genius. You can follow my man Money Parkway on Instagram. You can follow my man Jimmy Rocket. These are just some of the artists. I don't want to leave nobody out. But those are the artists I kind of communicate with on a regular, you know. So, uh, shout out to whole A, man. Whole Atlanta, man. Block. Uh, Jermaine. Uh, Born Immaculate. Moot B. D4L. The whole D4L. And that's about it, man. Mozzarella, yeah, Parmesan I finessed them, told his that it was a one-on-one -on -one. But really, it was cheap I been jigging all week I just took a nigga yeah. one